We're live and welcome to beautiful Denver, or I think somewhere slightly outside of Denver, Bloom, Broom, Broomfield, it's Bloomfield, Interlochen, <laughs> Interlochen. Yeah, so so uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm live on site here in, in Denver. It's nice and warm. I'm gonna use Denver because it's easier than Broomfield. Um, and at the Glucon conference, it, this is a cool conference. It's 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 not one of those giant conferences that you'd expect with you know thousands and of people around. But I like it. it it's it's got a smaller sort of community feel and I, and I get to sort of meet up with a lot of folks I see in the industry and, and uh, in a more intimate setting. One of those people is Rob Her Hirschfield for, from Rackend, OpenStack, general sort of provocateur. <laughs> so welcome to the, uh, the show. I appreciate being here. It's fun to talk. We get to dish out a little bit of gossip and yeah. talk some tech. Love it. You know, one one of the things you know, we, we met what about a, about a month, month and a half ago, and at random dinner. I met, actually met him long ago. I think it was like a uh, one of those. Uh, what, what do you guys call those dosas? No, uh, yeah. Um, uh, cloud dosa. The word. Cloud, oh, cloud dosa. Yeah, the yeah. dosas are amazing. Yeah, exactly. And and I, I you know I, I'm always the guy that sort of stirs it up, and you you push back. So I, I when I saw you here, I thought, AWS. hey, you you need to be on the show for sure. <laughs> You know, someone that, that, that's uh, willing to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. So, you know, one of the things, you know, that, that really intrigues me and is around the sort of work that you're doing. And, you know, as someone that's been in, involved in infrastructure for a long time, I'm, I'm aware of things like Pixie Boot. And, I, and one of the, when, I, when I saw the PX, you know, E on, you know, on display in front of your booth, I, I was immediately intrigued. You know, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm not going to knock it. I'm not going to call it 15-year-old tech or anything. It is 15-year-old okay, tech. Okay, it is 15-year-old yeah, tech. Yeah, 20-year-old tech. Yeah. So, what are you doing with this? Uh, what are you doing with this tech? Or and maybe wow. explain what Pixie even is to the the, the uninformed. So, <laughs> so Pixie stands for pre-execution environment. Okay. P X E, um, and it's this ancient tech. It's firmware embedded in servers for the last 20 years mm -hmm. that allows them to network boot fundamentally. But because it's firmware, it's super small and stupid. Okay. And so it's just enough of an environment that you can download a better environment. And then we actually download a better environment using that. So that uses an ancient technology called TFTP, which is like FTP but even the number. It's yeah. UDP. It's FTP. It's you, so you might, you might not get it? Is that the... Uh, that's, yeah. That's, well, that's, a, that's an old UDP it's joke. An old UDP. <laughs> and so, but we download a, a, a kernel operating system with that, and then we download another kernel operating system that we can do over HTTP so it's faster. Um, but it's this this boot pixie this boot provisioning process, and it's not just pixie. You have this TFTP technology. You also have to integrate with DHCP, which is the way people get IP addresses and other information when they bootstrap machines initially. Um, so it's this very convoluted set of core infrastructure technologies that you have to apply in a very specific sequence okay. to make all this stuff work. And that uses a technology that's universally known. Kickstart or pre <laughs> which is the way you script an operating system to do that initial install. So did you go and find the, the most loathed software you possibly could to create <laughs> like the the, the anti-stack? Like what like you, you your your adjectives are, are, are not exactly um, embellishing the, the, the te technical well, choices here. The, the challenge is this stuff is, is really um, it's it's sort of low-tech stuff and then you have to get it right or mm -hmm. the whole infrastructure falls down. And so we've had some really old tools. Uh, Cobbler's the oldest. Um, Foreman um, is another one. There's there's some other technologies that people have been trying to use to sort of bring servers up and boot them. But it's a thankless, tricky job, and so not many people do it. We care because we do full system provisioning. So our goal. So this is a, the necessary first step in getting a full, fully automated system. Right. Our goal is to be able to have basically the robot data center of the future, where systems automatically reprovision themselves, and they reflash their BIOS, and they you know, dynamically manage this, this whole infrastructure. Um, that's really cool, Yeah, but you can't do it if you can't manage that first kernel. That's the first step. So it sounds to me like you're, what you're going after is this idea of bare metal provisioning. Is, is, am I getting... That's get, a core feature for what we do. Okay, so and, and one of the big challenges in sort of the approach to a lot of containers is it's like virtualization <laughs> with containers. So it's like an abstraction on top of an abstraction on top of an ab ab abstraction, which each level of abstraction adds sort of an additional level of performance hit. Well, complexity and cost, Comple performance. Security. 
it's, problems. So what you're saying is skip all that you know abstraction and go right to the metal, and then deploy containers or how do you, so, what, are you, what are you deploying? So two years ago, we we've been doing containers for a long, long time since the Docker point eight days. Mm -hmm. we were even doing uh, giant uh, open Solera zone type stuff way back in our in our in my team's history, which is which wait is, a second, yeah. second. You just jumped into a whole other can of things. Uh, so our Solera zones are containers. Solaris zones are very close to containers. They're, yes, very they're very close. close, but they're not containers, are they? They're effectively containers. They're process isolation spaces. They're not fully virtual. space Yeah, they're, they're, they're very similar. Very, very similar. So, so, and then, so, so yeah. are containers really a thing? Containers are totally a thing. So the way we talk about containers, it's a combination of two technologies. The Solaris guys are going to love this. Okay. It's a combination of two technologies that um, Joint did a good job combining them: Solaris zones and um, uh, ZFS, mm -hmm. which is a journal file system. So you take those two things together, you have Docker, which is a, con con uh, a jail rooted process control and a journal file system. It's a, this isn't new stuff, they, they, and nobody's ever claimed it was new. It's just well, better use. It's so BSD jails and all this sort of stuff. I, you know, back in the old days, and you know, as my viewers know, because I always mention it, but I'm gonna mention it again. <laughs> I, we used something called user mode Linux. Uh -huh. You know, back in 2003, to which everyone told me I was crazy. The future is virtualization. Uh, apparently, it was for a very brief period of time. And I think <laughs> we call that year run. Yeah, cloud 1.0 maybe. Um, so now we're back. We're what's old is new, and what's new is old. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So I mean, the, the challenge that I see with containers is it's really not infrastructure. Mm -hmm. When you're doing containers right, it's not an infrastructure statement. It's a process statement. It's a packaging statement. Whereas VMs are really an infrastructure statement. So yeah. when, when we deal with things, we typically have an infrastructure mindset. So we want a node, we want an IP address, we want uh, names, right? All this stuff that you do for infrastructure. Yes. Most people who want to do containers don't want to do infrastructure. They, they're, they're, this is what I call the developer rebellion against infrastructure. So serverless, Kubernetes, containerized work, it's really saying, look, we're going to give you code, we're going to package it, we're going to get it into production, we'll own that. That's DevOps, great. But load balancers and PKI and running servers and making sure there's uptime and all, all, that's that's infrastructure. I, I'm not as interested in infrastructure, right? That's the domain of what, what we're calling SRE or yeah. Site Reliability Engineers. And so there's this this, this split that we're, we're that's reemerging, right? We're saying, you know what? I don't want to manage the full stack. That sort of sucks. I want to manage my app. I'll take it all the way to production. I want somebody to manage the infrastructure. And we're splitting them actually really nicely. So who do you compete against? Like, what are the companies that have that are the big players in this space? So uh, Canonical, with their combination of Juju and Mass, mm -hmm. um, is has overlapping technology from us. Um, they like to position it that way, and, and so we see them as competitive. Uh, on point solutions like you know Cobbler and Foreman um, are part of the story that we do, so we replace that. But then we add things that they don't even touch, like RAID and BIOS configuration. Um, really, actually going all the way into Ansible, Chef, Puppet, Salt, whatever type of automation, and then hybrid. So the big thing that we realized, we worked backwards from containers, okay. and we said, look, containers are awesome. They're gonna be all over the cloud, right? We're gonna see Amazon and Google and OpenStack and um, other places where people do deployments with containers. And we do not want those deployments to be different cloud to mount. We also saw that people were going to bypass VMs and put containers right on metal because of efficiency and simplicity and performance and cost. And so for all those reasons, we said, how do we prepare for containers on metal? And the way we did that is we said, we're going to get really good at containers on cloud. Okay. And then make it so that what works in cloud can work in metal. So but operational containers. Containers on cloud is, is a consumption model. It, it, it's, it works because it's easy and accessible. It's not necessarily the most uh, practical, right. but when you're looking to gain access to thousands or tens of thousands of, of instances quick, huh? it's just easy to go to one of the big three uh, cloud providers and stick the credit card in and get it and go. Um, and totally and right. the question, you know, when it's an abstraction, I might not be using the most effective means of getting the CPU, but it really doesn't matter, does it? No. I, I, so this, I, I like to be very clear. We think there is no one right answer. So I'm not saying, oh, you should give up VMs and go all the metal. There are totally great places where VMs make a lot of sense and you should use them. 
and there's places where you're like, well, you know what, I have to do really intense computing, or I'm using hundreds of VMs, it makes sense to just put it on metal and run it on metal. So, you know, the idea here is that we're trying to create a single operational approach that works across multiple types of infrastructure. And that includes different hardware vendors, different network topologies, right? We want to take that heterogeneity that makes it hard to share and repeat operations and make that more uniform. But we're not trying to force people, actually I think it's a mistake to try and force people into one thing or another. Because mm -hmm. the next thing you know, we're going to have a replacement for something else, right? And, and we're always going to innovate, we're always going to add the next thing. Well, it, it's, so, the ideal customer, they're, yeah. they're a hosting provider, they're a data center operator, like, who's, who's looking to sort of get the performance and scale from, you know, hardware? Centric so, wow. it, it, the, there, the number of companies that are running significant size data center infrastructure mm -hmm. is across industry. So we haven't we haven't seen one vertical uh, stack that is more than others, uh, but it's people who are running multiple data centers, hundreds of servers, and hybrid. So they have cloud and physical assets. Usually they're they're running OpenStack, a VMware. They want Kubernetes in that mix. They want to then right, they're moving a data center from one location to another. They're adding a lot of servers. Okay. Um, and then the other thing we're seeing some interest in is people who want to play with immutable infrastructure, like um, Linux Kit or CoreOS or Rancher. And those infrastructures basically require you to be really good at boot provisioning and automating that process because you're not installing the OS; you're just booting it one time over the network. Yeah. So to, you know, to, just to recap for any people who aren't familiar with, with immutable, we're, th um, we're throwing all sorts uh, of um, immutable is this idea of deploying a, a, a machine that essentially is locked to a point that that is once it's deployed, you don't have access to it. You can't shell into it. You can't really do any. You can't change it. It's kind of like a a lock block of sorts and it's only meant to run for a limited period of time and kind of go away. We're, we're trying so, to get out of configuration so yeah people sort of said you know can, taking a server configuring it and reconfiguring it sort of sucks mm -hmm. it's hard to manage and it's not very secure so if we could take a server build a static image for it deploy it and then basically give it some initialization information just like you do on cloud, mm -hmm. and no SSH, no, you know, we could make it a lot more secure, a lot more robust, you'd know exactly what you deployed, you'd get out of the, oh, that was the server that I had to fix on Wednesday, and it's this unique snowflake. So it removes all that, all those uh, problem spaces in ops. Okay. You it know, creates new ones too, of so, course. So, so, you know, you're, we, I'm gonna call you back to the future. Cool. You know, you, you guys are kind of, Go, going with the uh, you know taking it all the way back and all the way to the front. front. What where does this go? Where what do you see this progressing? You know what's what's the next logical step in this evolution? Wow, I mean we're really we're really moving towards uh, getting machine learning, AI, fully automated data centers. Right? We think that with what we've built as a foundation, it's not that hard to see a place where you can buy servers or rent servers and they can really run themselves to a large extent. Um, the challenge we see is actually not getting to that vision. The problem that we see is actually helping people step into that one step at a time. So the pixie boot stuff that you're talking about, that we started the whole interview on, that was, that's a way of saying, all right, I need my first step. Because you can't go from where we are today to a fully automated data center. We're going to have to find this incremental path to get people there. Um, otherwise, it's too big, a, too big a bite. That's it. So, so you think that the future of the data center is peopleless. Uh, I think that it's, yeah, I think that it can be. So, I, you know, it's, it's almost, you know, I've seen this analogy going around a lot in the uh, Kubernetes space, kind of the driverless infrastructure, uh -huh. right? Where, where you're you're deploying, it's magically, to, you know, fixing its issues. It, it, the, the components for the most part are immutable, they're serverless, you know, and when, when I throw the room serverless, I don't mean there's no server underneath, I mean, the it's event driven. It uses a lambda sort of right. approach to the application development, um, and then ultimately, what does that mean for you know the the DevOps professionals of 2017? Do we need to have a DevOps guy anymore, or is it no ops <laughs> and, and AI ops or something? So, so the things that we're taking over from that perspective are really things that people can't do today effectively. Right, most of the companies that we talk to aren't reprovisioning their gear. They set, get it from factory, they set it up once and they leave it. And then they have all these security flaws and issues and unpatched things. We're really addressing stuff that people aren't doing right now anyway. 
from a DevOps perspective, you don't want to spend your time flashing BIOSes and installing operating systems and patching things. You want to spend your time analyzing root causes, right, moving up the stack, doing logging and performance management, responding to you know, those types of, of actions. So what we're really doing is freeing people up to move up stack so that they can take those things on. Um, nobody wants to do the grunt. It's like digging trenches. Nobody yeah. wants to dig a trench. Well, I think some people want to dig trenches if, if it's better than being unemployed. Um, yes. I, you know, I, I think the, the challenge is the, the, the ever-evolving landscape of system administration, development, deployment is changing almost on a daily basis. It's almost like when you've learned, oh, I'm now the, the company DevOps guy. Whoops. DevOps is dead, now we're going to NoOps. <laughs> and okay, 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 I'm now the NoOps guy. Whoops, uh, it's now AI ops. Uh, sorry, it's like, how, how, you know, how, how do you adapt in, a, in an environment that's increasingly adapting at ridiculous paces? So, I, you're right, there's definitely a learning curve where we're gonna have to keep evolving this. I, I'll tell you, most of the operators I know are 150% overworked. Mm -hmm. There's a shortage in market, they're very hard people to find. Right. What we really want to be able to do is take that expertise and let them breathe enough to apply what they really know. Um, so it's totally a problem that we're going to have to face, not just in this industry, but across across all industries, as we start freeing time from routine manual tasks and moving it into more automated tasks. Um, but I, I really believe that there's new things that people could be focused on adding value in. What we've what we've done here is you know, we make people do things that don't require a lot of mental energy. Um, and then they spend all their time doing that because it's just this, this drudge work. And I, I agree, yeah, you want a job, and we're gonna have to figure out, this is an, an industry-wide thing, right? I'll take autonomous cars. If we take jobs away from truck drivers and give them to autonomous cars, and say, well, now you're a robot maintainer instead of a driver, uh, that might not work for everybody. So we're gonna have to find social safety nets that allow people to find meaning in life and, and, and have sustenance or we're going to have revolutions. Um, yeah, it's a huge social issue brewing in this that's going to have to get addressed. It's funny, yeah, you're, you're talking about the sort of future, the future of work and the future of, and of and a, a world where things become autonomous, whether it's a, a truck driver, a DevOps guy, a programmer, a graphic artist, I don't know. It's almost like anything and everything that can be automated is, is probably will be automated, whether it happens in five years or 50 or 500, I have no idea, but it, it probably will eventually happen. And, you know, the, you know, the existential question for, for humanity is, is how do we as individuals fit into a world that's automated, but hopefully automated to our benefit? Um, <laughs> I don't know. And that, that's way yeah, out in a round. Yeah, we, we just we jumped, we jumped all the way from Pixie Boot <laughs> yeah, to Skynet. Yeah, yeah Skynet. In, in 20 minutes. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> but, but, yeah, random thoughts <laughs> on, on, a, on a random Wednesday. And, <laughs> that, though, is very real. There, there, these, all these, these, it's not that hard to link this stuff today. And that's what makes IT so exciting. So we're, you're, you're either the automator or the automated. That is probably the right way to say it. So, you know, we're, we're coming up to our 18 minute mark. I'm, I'm going to say a shout out to the, the actual interlocking team. I've never seen anyone remove furniture so quietly. Yeah, it's hard to believe. They took, you know, probably two tons of, of, of these chairs off this deck. Without making a peep. I, I'm, I'm very, very impressed. So shout out to the interlocking team for, uh, you, you probably missed it because it's in the background, but they've been busy work while we've been doing this. So roughly the last- before and after picture. Yeah, rough, roughly the last 18 minutes has involved removal of all <laughs> furniture other than ours. <laughs> 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 I don't know what's going to happen next. Though, I'm, right? I'm keeping this spot because I've got a, a, a series of, of other live casts coming up. Uh, we, we've got Craig McLucky from Heptio coming up next. And we've got, uh, well, off the top of my head, I can't remember, but we had some really interesting people. We got Chris Nova coming up as well. So, uh, Rob, really appreciate it. Where can our viewers learn more about you, your company, follow you, all that kind of stuff? So I am Zehicle, Z-E-H-I-C-L-E, online, on GitHub, just about everywhere you look. Um, I do a lot of blogging under robfirstfeld.com, where, where, where I throw out opinions on site reliability engineering and ops and infrastructure and things like that. My company's name is Rack N, uh, and the project that we do a lot of this work under is called Digital Rebar. It's an open source. So the things we're talking about are open source. We believe in open source operations and community sharing quite a bit. So uh, Digital Rebar is the place for all things related. Okay. So.
And uh, I, I didn't mention OpenStack. Oh, I did. Sorry, I, I, just, I just ruined it. I just ruined it. Okay. Um, well, it's it's been a pleasure. Uh, I'd like to have you on the show again. We should do like a like a virtual panel or one of those things where we get like a bunch of people and we all argue for twenty minutes. Oh, those are fun. <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, I want to have you back. Thanks again for taking the time to talk to me. Thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, we'll be back in about 10, 15 minutes with our next guest. Thanks for tuning in.